Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, and my very dear friends, it is such a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this exciting intergenerational and multi-stakeholder panel, the subject line, Crises in the Achievement of Gender Equality in Peace, Security, and Humanitarian Action. But before we start, my dear friends, let me take you for a second to another time and another place. And let's see if you recognize these words, where they come from. And they start with the following. We, the peoples of the United Nations. I can see some smiles here because I do see that some of you recognize. I'll continue. We, the peoples of the United Nations, are determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, of nations large and small. Of course, as you know, this was written in 1945. Naturally, this is the preamble of the United Nations Charter. Already then, my colleagues, war and peace was central. Equality between men and women was central. 50 years down the line, we had the Beijing Platform, 1995, and one of the 12 key areas in Beijing was again women, peace and security. Since then, my colleagues, tremendous gains have been made in achieving the women, peace and security agenda from the signature of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 in year 2000 and the following resolutions, also, the New York, New York Declaration on Refugees and Migration in year 2016. But equally important that 95 states have translated these commitments into national action plans and almost 70% of the Security Council revolutions nowadays make explicit reference to women, peace and security compared to only 15% in the time frame of 2000 to 2005. Tremendous gains have been made that these are all worth celebrating. But at the same time, dear colleagues, huge gaps remains in the achieving of true gender equality in the women, peace and security and agenda and humanitarian action. Only 13% of all negotiators are women. 6% of mediators are women. 6% of signatories to major peace processes are women. 40% of human response plan lack meaningful engagement with local women organizations and only 2% of bilateral aid goes directly to women organization. And all of this is despite the fact, despite the evidence that peace agreements are more likely to last when women are at the table and that governance is more effective where leadership is diverse and inclusive. Today, my friends and here, we want to take stock of the gains that have been made since Beijing and discuss the various efforts made by government, civil society, international organizations, and regional bodies from all over the world. We will discuss the gains. We will also discuss what else are needed to accelerate the achievement of the WPS agenda. And we have an incredibly exciting list of speakers today with us and they will share their insights, expertise, deep knowledge on how best to accelerate the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and, implement in, and the implementation of the existing commitments. This discussion will of course directly feed into the session on Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which is going to take place tomorrow. Before we start, three short technical notes. One, don't forget to select your preferred language in the interpretation button. You can choose between French, Spanish, English, and sign language. Two, if you have any question, please do not hesitate to write it in the chat, and we will come back to those at the end of the session. And three, there is, of course, time limitations today. So we will not, uh, I will introduce each uh, speaker very briefly. Uh, but please take note that the full bio and contact details are all going to be uploaded on the chat. So please, as we go along, be sure to check the chat continuously. Without further delay, Ms. Radhika 
Kumara, Kumaras, I'm sorry, Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy, please, the first question is posed to you. You held the pen of the very first ever report of women, peace and security. Now, looking back, what are your thoughts about where we are now compared to that time, the greatest successes, success and the biggest gaps that are remaining in the women, peace and security agenda? Radhika, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I must say there is some interference from another panel. Uh, so I just thought I should bring that to your notice. Your, your question basically has two parts. What are the gains and what are the gaps? The gains of the women, peace and security agenda is I would use the word recognition. Uh, the recognition of, of issues and the creation of international framework standards and practices with regard to these issues. And there are specific areas of that recognition. The first is the area of sexual violence with a comprehensive ICC framework and a dedicated SRSG on sexual violence and conflict with a monitoring and reporting mechanism. Another specific area of recognition is the need for women's representation in peacemaking, peace building, and peace negotiation. And another specific area is partial recognition of violent extremism and its effects on women. I say partial because what we look at often are terrorist groups and their effect on women, not really the counterterrorism strategies and the other alter strategies that have been adopted and their effects on women uh, recently. Now, what are the gaps? Well, the, with regard to sexual violence, I think we have to acknowledge what is not working. We have a comprehensive international framework, but women are not coming forward and for a whole host of issues, which I'm sure we can explore in the dis discussion. And so we have to explore the concept of transformative justice models, which go beyond formal workings of tribunals uh, and, uh, and deal with justice, perhaps even at the community level. Uh, and the second thing I want to say is with regards to women's participation, especially in peace negotiations, as we know in Afghanistan, this is also not taking place. And perhaps we should rethink our campaign. Uh, Christina Shobel Patel shows how a lot of human rights campaigns have what she calls a branding quality and have taken away the politics from actually dealing with these issues. Maybe we have to go into more bilateral discussions and all those kinds of tactics that we have done in the years before. And finally, and most importantly, we have to move beyond gaps and recognize what is the major priority for women living in these complex zones, which was there even when I did my report. And that is, as, some, as someone said in the 1990s, it is the economy stupid. Post-conflict reconstruction is a serious issue. Uh, we continue to teach them low-level livelihood skills, uh, and they take loans to do that, and there's just a cycle of debt and poverty. Though, of course, there are some success stories. So we need to bring the political economy into the analysis. We need to bring the local into the analysis. Local political and economic structures make or break life for women in conflict zones, and we must increasingly recognize that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Radhika. I might quote you on that. It's the economy, stupid. It makes perfect sense in many, many ways. Um, thank you so much for this very, very valuable insight. Now, Ms. Ambassador Hiland, you are currently playing a critical role together with Mexico in the Security Council as co-chairs of the Informal Experts Group on Women, Peace and Security. Now, in your distinct opinion, share with us what are the synergies that can be built between the various platforms, the work at the Security Council level, the Women, Peace and Security Compact, intergovernmental mechanisms, UN bodies, etc. And how could these synergies improve the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda overall? 
Um, thanks, Susanna. And, and first of all, can I just say thank you so much for um, inviting me to, to participate in this panel. Um, also, obviously, it's been a real honor for us to partner with, with Mexico um, in Women, Peace and Security, co-chairing um, the um, informal expert group on, on the Council. Um, and thank you to, to Mexico, obviously, and also to France and UN Women and Civil Society for hosting this event. Um, we've also recently been confirmed as a board member um, of the Compact on Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action, which is something I also wanted to, to draw attention to and, and just note uh, how pleased we are to do that. Um, in terms of sort of the synergies, I'll come to that in a moment, but maybe one thing I'd like to say first, um, and particularly because I know that not everyone in the audience will be necessarily familiar with Ireland's role on women, peace and security and where our interest and engagement on this comes. Um, I might just note why or, or explain a little bit why it's such a priority for Ireland. Um, many of you probably know that Ireland um, experienced our own conflict. Uh, we experienced conflict on the island of Ireland uh, in the recent past. And we have really seen at first hand um, how women's role in the peace process um, was absolutely critical to ensuring uh, a durable peace agreement. And that was both as formal negotiators within the formal negotiating process, and also um, through women's work in the community. Um, and it's something I think that we have really learned from, um, learned from both our successes in it, and also I think learned that perhaps uh, we could have done better, and particularly we could have done better in terms of having more role for women as, as formal negotiators. But it's something I think that's very, um, very personal to us, uh, and something that we have seen really, really works and that we sort of believe at our core and through our own experience that without the full participation of women, peace cannot possibly be sustainable uh, and durable. But just, just to answer your question uh, or the specific question, I mean, I think it very much makes sense for us to join the dots between the work of the Security Council, um, both through the IEG uh, on Women, Peace and Security, which we co-chair, but much more broadly also across the whole gamut of the Security Council's agenda and then the work of the Generation Equality Forum um, on WPS and Humanitarian Action. Basically, we all want the same thing, um, and that is to advance the implementation of existing commitments on WPS. We have a really impressive and extensive normative framework on WPS. Um, we don't need to formulate new promises. Um, we need to actually use every tool at our disposal and cultivate partnerships across the widest possible range of organizations to implement what we have already. Um, and we're really trying to use our role on the Security Council and our seat in 2021 and 2022 on the Security Council to mainstream WPS across our engagement on all country files and all thematic files. I sort of hate the word mainstream, but I, I can't think of a better word, but it's basically trying to have WPS at the heart of and a gender lens at the heart of and um, what we are trying to do on the Security Council again across all of the 30 plus country files and 20 plus thematic files that the Council um, deals with. And obviously this a big part of that is working with Mexico um, on the informal expert group. And in that group, we very much focus on engaging with the UN leadership in the various different country situations that come to the Council on how they are implementing WPS uh, on the ground. And that's particularly important. It's very much trying to hold to account um, leadership, uh, UN leadership in various different conflict situations as to how they're actually implementing what is in their mandates on WPS. The dynamics around WPS are not simple. I think everybody knows that. Um, we have to be clear sighted about the difficulties. Um, at the Security Council in particular, it, it is a difficult file or it's a file that, that has difficulties in terms of gaining agreement and particularly gaining support. Um, the issue of the, the relevance of the WPS agenda, but also the issue of gender equality more broadly to peace and security is very much being challenged. Um, and it's really critical that member states that champion WPS. And what's fantastic about this, uh, this panel, but broadly speaking in general about the work on WPS is that it is cross-regional. You know, this is not just a niche area that certain countries or certain regions are interested in. There's a really broad buy-in to this from, from the broad UN membership. Um, and so it's really important that we unite, I think, um, and coordinate as effectively as possible to champion the WPS agenda across all of the different fora that it appears in. Um, there's clearly a read across, I think, in terms of membership of the Compact and the Security Council. So Ireland, obviously, I've, I've spoken about that, but Norway also um, is also a fellow board member on the Compact. Um, Mexico, obviously, uh, as co-chair of the uh, expert group on WPS and also as co-host of, of Generation Equality. Um, and the Compact also enjoys, I think, the experience of member states who have previously been on the Council. 
Um, and member states that have, have been really crucial to advancing the WPS agenda. And there I would maybe point in particular to Namibia. Um, so Namibia obviously shepherded resolution 1325 through the council and um, had had a really key role in the birth of, of 1325 and have played a really important leading role both in the council, but much more broadly, of course, also um, since then. And those sorts of alliances are exactly the ones that we need to, to build on. Um, partnership with civil society is obviously absolutely crucial um, to the su success of the compact. It was crucial to the success of the Beijing Declaration and the Platform for Action, crucial to the, the adoption of, of Resolution 1325. And as governments, as, or, as international organizations, if we don't work effectively with civil society, we're just simply not going to achieve anything. And again, that's something that we learned from our own peace process in Ireland as well, that a coordinated uh, um, effort, but across different, um, with different pieces of the jigsaw, I guess, doing, doing different bits of the work is what's most effective. Um, I think we try and replicate that type of approach in the council. Um, we try, for instance, in, in, to make sure that we're including civil society briefers in council discussions where the format allows, um, and also consulting civil society very widely in advance of, of closed meetings, just to make sure that we are reflecting the views and the experiences of women in the country situations or who have experience of thematic issues that are being discussed on the council. Um, it's also, I think, really important that UN Security Council um, members look to advance the emerging priority areas um, that have been identified by the compact. Um, and so particularly, for instance, for us as Ireland, we're really pleased to see that women's participation in peace processes, which again is a real priority for us and something that we have, have lived through ourselves, um, is one of the focus groups of the compact working groups. Um, and earlier this month, actually on International Women's Day, Ireland and Mexico co-hosted a event on women's full, equal and meaningful participation in UN-led processes. And that was co-sponsored by 12 out of the 15 Security Council members. And again, I think that's a really clear example of something that can gain cross-regional support from members of the council who on other issues have very, very different uh, views and different agendas, but can come together on, on a core issue uh, related to women, peace and security. And we had at that event speakers, including um, speakers from women peace builders from Northern Ireland and from Yemen. Um, and we basically called on the UN to set an example and to take the lead in driving forward the issue of participation of women in peace processes. Because obviously, as, as we heard in the um, introduction, um, it's still shamefully low, the participation of women in, pe in peace processes uh, and the participation of women as negotiators at the center of peace processes. And it's a key pillar of the women peace and security agenda. Um, in a previous life, before I was political director, I was ambassador accredited to Colombia. And one of the things that I was incredibly impressed by in the Colombian peace process was, was the number of women who were at the table uh, as core members of the negotiating team in the Colombian uh, context. And also in particular, the fact that in, in the Colombian uh, peace negotiations, there was a particular subgroup on gender from the very, very beginning. Um, so these are things that we have practical examples of and we can learn from, but they need to be brought, I think, to the attention and up to uh, the top of the agenda in the Security Council. And again, this is something that we're trying to trying to do or trying to work with others to do. Um, maybe just the last thing to say is engagement with other UN bodies and agencies is also really, really critical. Obviously, the Security Council has a core role in, in, in the maintenance of international peace and security, but the Women, Peace and Security agenda goes, goes much more uh, broadly beyond that. Um, so for instance, the Peace Building Commission, which we served on from 2019 to 2020, has a new gender strategy, and that has stepped up its work on the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And again, we know and we've seen that women are absolutely crucial for the peace building agenda. We've seen it in Ireland, we've seen it across Latin America, across African um, contexts as well. Um, and I see Benita Diop is on, is on the line as well, and we worked um, with the African Union and with Benita's office as, as envoy on 1325, exactly on that peace building role uh, for women in particularly certain um, African contexts. Um, human Rights Council obviously as well adopted a resolution last year on mainstreaming human rights that will also enhance um, its engagement on, on women, peace and security issues. And obviously regional organizations, as I mentioned, the African Union in particular, I think has really, and Benita, personally has really driven forward the 1325 agenda. I think the AU is, is probably the primary organization that has, has led, has shown the rest of us the way in terms of, in terms of the 1325 agenda. The EU also obviously has, has a strong commitment to gender equality and to the women, peace and security agenda. OSCE also, and I know that the OSCE and the AU are both represented um, on the compact. 
So I think, you know, they're, they're, they're just some examples, but I think it just shows the, the breadth and the depth of the possibilities in relation to the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And again, I think the more, the more organizations, the more countries, the more international organizations, the more regional organizations that push this agenda, the better, because I don't think we can be complacent about it. It's very easy in, a, in a, an environment like this when we're all together and all um, broadly believing in the same thing to, to think that we have won the battle. Um, but I think being a member of the Security Council has shown us we haven't won the battle in relation to peace and security, women, peace and security and to gender equality in general. Uh, and we need to keep that battle going. Uh, and the more of us that do that across the more um, different for us, the better. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Hiland. Very inspiring, a number of very inspiring examples of cross-entity, cross-organizational uh, collaboration, and not collaboration for the sake of collaboration, but for a specific goal, which is in this case, of course, the acceleration of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And you also touched upon regional uh, aspects of it, and we will come back in a second and dive into that very area. But first, I will turn to Ms. Maria Fernando Espinoza, and uh, the question we have for you is the following. Now, you have had a variety of roles, including Minister of Defense in Ecuador, but also as permanent representative of Ecuador to the United Nations. Now, can you tell us from your experience uh, and, and dive a little bit more into the importance to link the international and peace security agenda with the defense and security sectors at national level to bring forward the implementation of the women and peace security agenda. So it's basically the linkages between the peace and security agenda on one hand, and then the defense and security sectors on the other hand to in conjunction, accelerate or strengthen the women and peace security agenda. Over to you, Ms. Fernando. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. And, and of course, I, I cannot uh, avoid saying something uh, for a few words to congratulate the governments of Mexico and France and UN Women for hosting this Generation Equality Forum. I have to say that I'm very impressed uh, of uh, the work and dedication they have put into the organization of this forum as well as the leadership of these countries and, and others with, with the causes of gender equality, women's rights, and of course, uh, what brings us together today, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And if you allow me a little anecdote, you know, uh, the Generation Equality Forum is the outcome of a more than two year process of preparations. And I recall very vividly when we were negotiating the modalities resolution when I was the president of the UN General Assembly. And today, here we are, you know, we gathered with, uh, as I understand, more than 10,000 people joining the Generation Equality Global Conversation. So that only needs to be acknowledged and, and acknowledged and, and congratulated. It's the best way to, uh, to uh, commemorate uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Beijing, uh, uh, the Beijing Platform for Action uh, 26 years ago. Now coming to your question, Susan, I think that it is beyond doubt that policy, legislation and transformative action at the national level are of critical importance for, for advancing the implementation of the, of the uh, uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Every assessment that we know of coincide in the significant gap between existing multilateral mechanisms and frameworks and real change on the ground. And we have already heard so many examples uh, from uh, the panelists today, some successful stories, but also some setbacks and some huge you know, uh, implementation gap, gaps. And uh, I think that uh, we all agree that the peace and security sectors have been traditionally led by men you know, despite the fact that armed conflict and humanitarian crises have always had disproportionate impacts on, on women and girls. And uh, for example, just looking at the numbers, uh, Susan, you provided already some of the numbers, but sometimes it's, it's good, you know, to, uh, to say some numbers out loud. And uh, in 2019, the UN documented uh, close to 3000 cases of conflict-related sexual violence, of which 96% targeted women and girls. So um, 
you know, women also represent a, a significant share of all conflict affected people. And at the end of 2019, nearly 23 million women and girls worldwide were living in internal displacement because of conflict or violence. And, and here we have uh, uh, mentioned the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 many times. And we all agree that it does represent a reference point and an inflection point in the security and peace sectors uh, from a, a gender's perspective and a women's rights perspective. And, and, and I think we are learned from that uh, as, um, as, as a legal and political framework for the protection on women and girls, but also, and perhaps more importantly, you know, for calling for the participation of women in decision-making in national, regional, and international institutions. So I think that in this sense, uh, coming back to resolution 1325 and the eight subsequent, you know, uh, women, peace and security related resolutions from the Security Council and the General Assembly, I think that um, we, we have to say that, uh, you know, when we look at the impact on the ground of these resolutions, starting with 1325, we can see that there is, there is a huge, uh, huge implementation gap. Um, according to a, a UN women's study, uh, you know, we know already that when women are able to exercise a strong influence on peace negotiation processes, there is a much higher chance that an agreement would, uh, would be reached or that this agreement would, would last, last longer. So there is, um, a, you know, at least a, what we have learned is that a, when the political space is provided, a, women can and have made a meaningful, a, a meaningful contributions to the peace and security agenda. And coming back to your question in the national level, um, in my experience as foreign minister and minister of defense of my country, I, am, I have to tell you that I'm convinced that we can overcome the implementation deficit on the women, peace and security agenda. Parliaments, cross-regional uh, cooperation, uh, exchange of good practices is, is critical. But when we come to the numbers again, uh, when you see that less than 50% of countries have adopted national action plans for the implementation of uh, uh, resolution 1325. And just 32% of these plans included a budget for the implementation thereof at the time of adoption. So there is also not only the political traction, the leadership, but also the funding, the financing of implementation at the national, uh, at the national level. You said it very well, in-house within the UN, Let's look at the uh, close to 100,000 peacekeepers. Uh, women are only 4.8% 4 of the military contingents in our peacekeeping operations. So I think it is time to walk the talk and, and show the political will and leadership. I think that um, someone mentioned what is happening now and today as we speak in the Afghan uh, peace process and the participation uh, of, of women. Uh, for some concrete examples, perhaps let me share a very modest contribution. During my tenure as Minister of National Defense uh, of Ecuador, Ecuador became the third state in Latin America and the Caribbean to issue a gender affirmative action policy for the armed forces. And not only it included concrete zero tolerance uh, for harassment and discrimination, with an embassy, uh, emphasis in combating impunity, but also a plan to encourage women's enrollment and career development in the armed forces. It strengthened equal opportunities for men and women throughout their military career and established specific contents on human rights, humanitarian international law, gender equality in the formal education curricula uh, for uh, members of the military in my country. And um, in 2018, as, as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador, I also passed a gender affirmative action policy for the Ecuadorian diplomatic corps. 
along the same principles. And it also included um, um, affirmative action to include uh, enrollment of Afro-descendant and indigenous professionals in the diplomatic uh, services. So both policies were simply, you know, uh, the capacity of listening, you know, to the feminist movements, the political struggle of women, uh, and in as, as well as an effort to increase in representation of, of, of women in the, the uh, public services. And uh, I think that has and an, an, uh, has shown, you know, to be extremely important when uh, you look at uh, conflict resolutions uh, and uh, peace processes uh, to involve uh, women, uh, especially, uh, for example, in our peacekeeping operations. In, in the case, concretely, in the case of, of, of Ecuador, um, in the participation of, of female and women diplomats as we were serving as a host country for the peace negotiations between the Ejército de Liberación Nacional in Colombia and the Colombian government. And I have uh, uh, led uh, that process personally, and let me tell you that it does make a difference. Uh, I think that uh, the ambassador from Ireland mentioned the peace process in Colombia uh, as well. So the lessons learned here is when you are giving the opportunity, you know, we uh, women have to exercise our power and make the changes as quickly as possible, enabling political, and I think that for that, enabling political environments and leadership at the national level are key uh, to ensure that transformation happens uh, in, this, uh, in the women, peace and security agenda. I will simply close by saying that uh, I am very much looking forward to the discussions tomorrow on the new compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action. It is uh, uh, what, uh, what I have seen shows that it is a forward looking promising instrument to support countries and international institutions in closing this implementation gap. Uh, to coordinate better, better, to monitor better, and to have greater accountability. Account accountability, I think, it's critical uh, to the successful implementation of this agenda. So I'm convinced that the Generation Equality Forum in Mexico and late, later in, in France will consolidate uh, a strong compact showing uh, much needed uh, renewed political will for overcoming the structural bottlenecks that still uh, uh, hinder the rights and equal participation of women in peace, security, and humanitarian action. Uh, I thank you for your patience and, and back to you, Susan. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Fernanda, for these very, very interesting observations. You took us from a discussion that we might be more used to when it comes to women participation in negotiations, peace processes, to the other side, in a sense, which is the armed forces, the peacekeepers, uh, etc. And this is not usually a discussion we dive into, and I, I very much value your, your thoughts and insight uh, when it comes to those areas. And interestingly enough, we will actually do a little bit of a U-turn now again, because from armed forces and peacekeepers, we will touch upon disarmament process. I am going to turn to Ms. Angela Kane. And on the basis of your current experience at the Vienna Center for Disarmament, can you tell us more about how you see how the WPS compact can enhance synergies between gender equality in peace and security and, on the other hand, disarmament processes. Ms. Angela, over to you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And I just wanted to say that I joined the previous speakers in commending the organizers of this initiative. It's a great plan. It's a great uh, uh, for forum, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Now, I also um, thought it was great that you read part of the charter or the preamble of the charter. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, we only have the equal rights of men and women because there were very few women at the founding of the United Nations present. And who were the women who were pushing it through? 
Latin American women, so bravo. So that is really great. And if we hadn't had it for them, I don't think that we would have had that reference to equal rights of men and women in the charter. So I think this is really great. And when you come to a rights-based perspective, of course, women have the right to participate in international security and decision-making. And I will remember that the most memorable quote that I've ever heard, and that has been repeated over and over, was when Hillary Clinton said at the Beijing conference, women rights are human rights but of course they are and you know it was something that is so elemental and on the other hand it was very very memorable that it was and uh, what i have seen over my 35 years in the united nations primarily in peace and security and the last um, uh, the last um, function as high representative of disarmament affairs uh, i've seen that really women are very underrepresented in uh, uh, all international fora that are concerned with peace and security, not only that, but so what we need is really targeted actions to improve women's participation. And I have a couple of suggestions that I will find out later on. But what does it really mean? What it means is that equal participation of women and men in all decision-making processes related to disarmament and international security, as well as in all of the components of it, panels, boards, expert groups that are relevant to uh, to the field of disarmament and uh, you mentioned uh, Suzanne also some facts relating to um, you know what are, is the representation what is the percentage right now of the peace negotiators and that is really important analyze it how many women are there how many women are there on the boards for disarmament how many women are there as ambassadors negotiating and that is really something that no one can deny because it's very stark it's facts and I think that facts are really important but greater participation alone is not really efficient in reducing the gender inequality unless women are actually at the table making the decisions until they can influence the decisions. And uh, there is also, what is also needed is a general appreciation of others, let's say men, uh, among the multilateral practitioners for the ways in which the substantive issues that they deal with are often gendered. And that is also very often needed. People, men don't very often realize what impacts it has. And that's why also women need to be at the table to come forward with this. And this is a point that's very well made in the WPS agenda, which really underlines the, the role of women in conflict prevention and management and resolution. But also, and that is very, very important, recognizing women not only as recipients of aid or justice, but also as agents agents that are integral to the peace, stability, and security. And I appreciate Radhika when she spoke about uh, how, how it all started and, and what changed. And that is really something that I have seen that in the beginning when Resolution 1325 was adopted, even though it had three pillars, the one pillar, women as victims, was much more emphasized than it is now. And I think we've really moved away from that meaning that yes, women are still victims, and yes, that is still a very important part of the agenda. But on the other hand, the other pillars, the other two pillars, that's also have come and gained a lot more prominence, and that is really uh, important. But I also want to come back to disarmament, and when I look at multilateral arms control and disarmament frameworks, then you can see that gender perspectives have really had quite an impact. And I'm only thinking about the Convention on Cluster Munitions, for example, arms trade treaty and also various general assembly resolutions that have been adopted on that. But this inclusion of the gender responsive, I should call them gender responsive provisions, has really shed the light on the different impact of weapons on women and on girls and on boys, but enhanced the general community, the international community to really redress gender inequality. One statistic that I looked up, again, here we have the facts, is that uh, last year in 2020, the first committee which deals with disarmament uh, issues, 25% of the first committee resolutions and decision included, included gender perspectives. I think this is unprecedented. I think this is fantastic. Then you had 72 resolutions adopted uh, and 18 of them included gender perspectives. Now, very often the emphasis is on women's equal participation, but a growing number of resolutions also consider the gendered impacts of specific weapons. And there are a number of countries, including Ireland and Mexico, that are very, very instrumental in this, and I must commend them really for this. And when it comes to one resolution that rang particularly with me, that was from the last General Assembly, is that women should not only be perceived as victims of gender-based armed violence, 
but they're also essential in preventing and reducing armed violence and are active and key players in advocating for arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. And let me mention something else. Civil society, which was also mentioned by you, has been extremely instrumental in getting to treaties. I mean, if you think only about civil society was very active in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Again, Mexico played a very high role in that, also in, uh, in organizing one of the conferences on the humanitarian uh, consequences, but also because uh, you had the, um, uh, the mine ban treaty, the anti-personnel line ban treaty, there were women who were leading efforts to basically combat that. And Beatrice Finn, who was the uh, head of the ICAM, the International Campaign Against uh, Non-Proliferation of uh, Nuclear Weapons, basically got, was awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 after the treaty was adopted. Really, this was a very high visibility for women and women in peace and security. Now, <clears throat> What happens in some of these resolutions that I mentioned, sometimes it is mentioned only the women issue, the gender issue is only mentioned in the preambular paragraphs. That needs to change. It needs to be brought also into the substantive paragraphs uh, where it really is kind of the meat on the bone, so to say. But other, other issues that we should have, there should be agenda items should be adopted that examine actually gender perspectives. We could also have an approval of mandates for integrating gender perspectives into the substance of the delegates work. Uh, you could have gender responsive language included in uh, resolutions. And also you can organize gender briefings related to the substance of the work. And also you have gender champions and, and so forth. So there's a lot of activities that can be done. And you also have various networks, I mean, including like what we're having here. There are many of them that are maybe at the regional, sub-regional country level and that we can engage with. So those are really my thoughts on, uh, on what can be done in disarmament. But I must say we've come a long way to where we, where we started way back when. So thank you very much. And back to you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Angela. I appreciate very much what you say. I also appreciate that you understood very quickly what I was hinting at when I put on my mic and you wrapped up in a second. I hope that I don't I didn't rush you, Angela, but we will come back to you because we do have uh, some questions actually for you also at the end. I really appreciate how you took us from the emphasis of women participation, not only as it, not only is it important with participation, but influencing the decision making processes, but also the progression on the narrative from women being victims to active contributors to peace processes, to peace agreements, etc. You took us in a way throughout a timeline here and how the narrative has changed throughout this timeline. Now, uh, I will turn to a colleague of mine, Paivi, uh, over to you, because Paivi, you are Chief of Peace, Security and Humanitarian Section at UN Women. And the question to you is very succinct and down to the point. So what are the key lessons to ensure that a national action plan on 1325 is a successful one? Thank you, Susanne, very much for a question and such an honor to be in this panel of all trailblazers in women, peace and security. So let me say on your question, let me say about the price in the category of uh, uh, most perfectly and successfully implemented national action plan has not yet been shared and it's still up open for competition, so please go for it. But of course, uh, and I, I want to reiterate what many of you have already said, I mean, we are talking about Security Council decisions when we talk about women, peace and security. We're talking about, can I say, hardcore peace and security issues? And these are commitments of the member states to implement issues that are seen critical to advancing indeed the Charter of the United Nations, like Susanne, you, you started saying. And it is a pity that only 49% of the member states have adopted a national action plan, but it is already 49%. So more to come, I'm sure. So what we have uh, learned or lessons learned that um, one of the key issues is really the national ownership and, uh, and its inclusion. I, I would stress the word inclusion in national action plan. So like I said, it's uh, commitments uh, by the member states, but we are talking about uh, uh, 
prepare, preparing a national action plan and implementing it with a wide inclusion from a society. Of course, the government, different ministries, civil society has been mentioned. I also want to say uh, private sector, academia have a role to play. Parliament is critical. It was mentioned here also before. And then regional, international uh, organizations and other partners. This is just a list. And what I want to say that we, we're talking about high impact national action plans at UN Women. Of course, these are the dream documents. <laughs> and uh, every country will, will do what best suits their uh, purposes. But I want to highlight that monitoring of that national action plan and implementation of women, peace and security, having actually in indicators and, and monitoring it. And this comes together with accountability. Somebody needs to be responsible for implementing it, for delivering these important commitments. And uh, then, of course, the one more point I want to say is uh, financing and resourcing these national action plans. And I want to reiterate here, we are talking about national and uh, national peace and security issue, an issue of national peace and security importance. The first place to look for funding is from your national sources. It needs to be part of uh, national budgets and, and plans. Of course, if there is sometimes additional funding to do other nice things in addition to critical peace and security points, that's good. So, and then, uh, yeah, at the end, I just want to, these are the key points, and I wanted to say the stress is on inclusion and inclusive process, just like the Generation Equality Forum, and the, and the compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action that brings all the actors together and then implements it. So that would be my points. Thank you very much. That's great, Paivi. So basically inclusion, then financing the plan and monitoring, close monitoring with very concrete indicators that you can follow in real time. Thank you for sharing that insight with us, Paivi. And now I will uh, turn to a colleague of mine that we met in Aswan a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, Ms. Vineta Diop, such a pleasure to meet you first in Aswan and then here. Now, throughout your experience in the civil society space, peace building programs, and <clears throat> in the African Union Commission, also as a chair on W Peace and Security, could you share with us what are your thoughts when it comes to the main challenges in implementing the international frameworks on WPS at regional level? And of course, particularly from your experience and being the African continent. Ms. Pineta, over to you. Thank, thank you, Madam Moderator. Suzanne, thank you so much. Let me express our pleasure to be in uh, Mexico, even it is virtual for the Gen uh, Generation Equality Forum, and also salute the formidable work done by the team UN Women, Mexico, and uh, France. Um, I think that uh, as part of civil society movement, um, some of us sitting here who contributed to the adoption of the UN Resolution 1325, our first challenge in the continent, it's good to hear, you know, Pavey, because I'm just moving it in the context of Africa. You know, look at the UN, but looking it at the, at the African level. So for us it was first, because it's an instrument coming from uh, the, uh, the Security Council, we say, how do we domesticate it? That was our first challenge as a society. And we did a strong advocacy to make sure that we don't create new things, but it's really mainstream into our different instruments, such as the Maputo Protocol, uh, which was adopted in 2003, but also the Solemn Declaration on Gender Equality in Africa, in which our head of state and government committed to a full and effective participation of women in peace processes, building on the gender parity, 
um, which is inscribed in the AU Constitutive Act in 2002. So you could see that we didn't invent a new instrument, but it was really uh, put into our own um, instrument. So then implementation, we say, how are we making sure that they adopt this, but they implement them? And for me, as I said, when we look at into implementation, really there are key factors that impede on the implementation. And for me, the first thing, and I will zoom on it, is accountability. It has been said many times, many times, but accountability. And it's uh, on my sense in three elements, um, just, uh, just to summarize. The first element, as we say, is, and maybe alluded to it, is ownership and leadership. And we say ownership and leadership at national level is to ensure that it is inclusive, but also the allocation of funding and the oversight of the, um, uh, at why we sell the parliament. So to make sure that it is owned by the country, it doesn't remain in New York, but bring it down. So that's the first point for me. The second point is really on the accountability is to deliver, measuring and delivering an impact. It has been said many times that we need clear indicators that permit regular and systematic reporting. So we need to um, evaluate, you know, because it cannot be just in a drawer. We need to make sure it's implemented and we need to measure it as well. The, la the third point for me is coordination of action. Uh, with the involvement of civil society, uh, the women peace builders, the women activists, but also the grassroots women. It's so much in many countries we see that we translated into the local language for the women at grassroots to understand what is mean 1325 to them. So that's the ownership and the leadership that I, um, are for me that are important. So now as a special envoy, when I came at the AU to be the voice of the voiceless of the, the women that are affected, I came and there was maybe 16 to 17 countries that adopted a national action plan. Today, we have 30 countries that have adopted national action plan. So that's the country, the first country, uh, the uh, continent that have that number is more than the half of our continent that have adopted national action plan on 1325. The last was South Africa. Last week, we just launched the South Africa. Somebody talk about, uh, also Namibia, the ambassador of, of Ireland. And I think this, and the six region, regional economic community, including ECOWAS, have also a regional action plan. So then you have the plan, but how do you monitor? And just responding to those three areas. So we make sure my office to push our member state to adopt a continental result framework. We 41 indicators for the four pillars. And right now we are looking into the emerging threats, which will include surely in the future the COVID-19, but like climate change and issues relating to the environment as well. So that's the, the, the measure that we are doing using that framework, which have been adopted by the African Union. And we published the second report at the continent to link it to the international level so far um, Egypt, for example, are developing. I'm sure that very soon we will have more um, action, uh, uh, action plan. So we have 20 countries. It's, it's a really very minimum, 20 countries that have reported so far. My second report have been uh, you know, filled with the support of UN women. So it represents uh, at least you know, around 80% of countries that have developed a national action plan. So let me just say that COVID have revealed also violence against women, you know, what you and women call the silence uh, pandemic. And we need to look at it, even in the context of peace and security, the refugee um, that are in the camps, we need to look at that angle as well in the issues of the COVID. And I think that's why uh, together, and I'm sure that here we will look into how do we address this issue of rape, 
It has been also the impunity that goes with it. How do we fight for me? That's the issue that we need to tackle right now. Is violence against women, is rape that is happening in conflict, in, and how do we together in, uh, as I said, in the, the, the Mexico, in Paris, to find ways for us to create the space for women, address the, the justice issue, but also to support uh, uh, those who have been the survivors and the victim. In Africa, I'm just going to, uh, to conclude. We have currently created two great networks, the Africa Women Leaders Network, because we need to prevent, we need leadership. All of you, wherever you are, you are making sure Canada, um, Jacqueline, uh, Ambassador Hillan, wherever you are, you are making sure that you make women peace and security a priority. So women leadership matter. Let's make sure that we put the women in governance for preventive action. So Aulin is there supported by UN Women. We have 25 chapters so far, but also FemWise, which we think that uh, many of the region have created women mediators to respond because when you know the problem, what are the solutions? And if we have solution, how do we scale up those solutions? So I just wanted to stop there and again say we need to be vigilant and watch that it might be pushed back on women's peace Thank and security. And Thank we you. need to watch that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Diop. Always very insightful. Dear colleagues, just some small changes from my end. I'm not going to wrap up after each individual uh, minute, simply in because we need to save time. I know we have a couple of questions. And please, uh, my dear panelists, let's all try to stick to the three, maximum five, preferably around three minutes if possible, because we see now that there are questions in the chat. All right, so Ms. Fatima Yang, in your role as ECOWAS, you have underlined the relevance of the link between humanitarian and development. Now, in your opinion, what are the role of regional economic commissions in ensuring a holistic approach to advancing the WPS agenda? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll speak quickly. Usually I'm a slow speaker. But um, for us at the Economic Community for West African States, we have been at the forefront working with the women's movement in the region in pushing forward the agenda for the rights of women and girls and for gender equality. As a regional body, we recognize actually that the critical and dynamic nexus between gender development and peace and security is extremely important. The following insights on advancing what our regional economic commissions are drawn from these experiences. And what we think that we as regional in economic um, commissions can do is to ensure the full functioning and resourcing of the regional women peace and security fora and platforms to enable them to play a greater role in advocacy, oversight and implementation of the agenda regionally, as well as generate collective thinking about dealing with at country level challenges. Such alternative structures and processes can be more responsive than merely pushing for participation in existing structures and processes. We want to think that the REC should also support the development of regional plans, which not only mainstream gender internally within the regional organizations, peace and security architecture, but also emphasize coherence and synergy with national action plans and implement regional level programming through identification of high impact flagship projects, regional policies and action plans on women, peace and security can be complementary and mutually reinforcing to national action plans, as well as to other national and regional human rights and related sectoral policies and action plans. They can also help in promoting peace and security in the context of cross-border conflicts, which is a serious problem we have in our region, 
and also build an, um, a network, a critical mass of centers of excellence and research academic institutions engaging in women, peace and security research and capacity building. We also think as regional economic communities, we should establish channels for women leaders and civil society organizations to systematically contribute to the conflict prevention and peace building work of regional organizations, including by establishing regional advisory bodies of women peace leaders. Build regional capacity for monitoring and reporting on progress in the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, and to increase engagement, this is very important, and interaction with international and regional human rights mechanisms to ensure full consideration of women's human rights, a central component of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda for ECOWAS, and to collaborate with the UN to establish avenues for cross-learning and information exchange on gender sensitive priorities and concerns pertaining to the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, including by integrating those issues in joint dialogues and intergovernmental meetings on cooperation between the UN and regional organizations in the areas of peacemaking, preventive diplomacy, peacekeeping and peace building. With specific respect to humanitarian development nexus, work to ensure that the crafting of collective outcomes based on the SDGs, given their centrality in the deployment of the humanitarian development peace nexus and the new way of working, fully integrate gender analysis and objectives drawn from the, uh, the SDGs. The foregoing approach is critical in all contexts, humanitarian, development, and peace. And amongst all sectors and practitioners, especially in the context of peace, security, and development profiles of many West African and African countries. The ECOWAS Commission has developed a number of policies and institutional frameworks for developing and implementing UNHCR 1325. We have different protocols on democracy and good governance, the gender policy, the women, peace and security component of the ECOWAS conflict prevention framework and a number of action plans. And, but I think what is really critical for us hmm. is at the decentralized level, and I will be stopping soon, because I think at the higher level, we're seeing women engaging, but as you go down to the local level, in the, mm. at the village level, the women are not involved. You go to the local government level, the women are not involved the way they should be involved. So I think this is one area we're taking very seriously. We think that power, I personally believe that power comes from below and we have to start from the grassroots and move it up. The top down is not working, we're doing the reverse so that we Excellent. can get the results. <laughs> Ms. Fatima, I have to say that I have, a, I have a second quote here that I will use. Power come from below. And actually, you gave us the perfect segue to Jacqueline, because we are moving from regional again to national. Thank you so much, uh, Fatima, for your insightful observations and, and the presentation of the ECOWAS, ECOWAS work uh, on regional level. Ms. Jacqueline. Now, based on your leadership during the Canada's co-chair of the WPS Focal Point Network, can you share with us some of the best practices and lessons learned in implementing the WPS normative frameworks at the national level? And in particular, in relation to the importance of meaningful participation and leadership in designing and implementing national action plans. Over to you. Sure, thank you so much, Suzanne. Bonjour, buenos dias, hola. Uh, and welcome to my home in Ottawa, Canada, which is on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. So Canada has two official languages, French and English, and I'm gonna speak a little bit today in both. Uh, personnel d'une seule personne. Alors, le but, c'est d'arriver à un endroit 
clarifie, et a des, des réponses à ce sujet et consacre tout l'appareil gouvernemental à la mise en œuvre. I'll switch back to English because there might be a little bit of uh, background noise here. So in Canada right now, we're on our second national action plan, and we often emphasize that the first was under the leadership of one political party and the second under the current political party. So it's important that people don't see it as something that can be sort of weighted out or that they can wait until the government changes if they don't like it. So I'll briefly highlight three points of note from Canada, for example, where we have positive practices, but also room for improvement. And note that we share these experiences in the spirit of humility, and that the, the same spirit that all the members of the Women, uh, Peace and Security Focal Points Network bring to these conversations, this network that we currently chair with Uruguay and with support from UN Women. So the first is to stress the importance of meaningfully engaging civil society in the design and the implementation of the national strategy. And of course, the implement or the emphasis here must be on meaningful because many of us have been in civil society organizations uh, where we've been consulted when a document is nearly final and the chance to make changes are minimal. So consulting early is important. Something that we've done in Canada that was inspired by other countries in this focal points network, including Afghanistan, is to have an official role for civil society. So in our country, we have a tremendous civil society organization, the Women, Peace and Security Network of Canada, and they co-chair along with the government an advisory group for our national action plan. It's written right into the plan. We meet at least twice a year and have been doing it more. This is positive, yet one of the areas in this theme where we need to improve with respect to civil society engagement relates to young people. And more and more, I think many of our countries are realizing uh, the importance of being specific, including by naming the importance of youth, about their engagement in drafting and implementing the plan. And, and we are reflecting, uh, including at the urging of fabulous new youth networks in Canada on how to ensure that young people are not just inserted into existing projects and asked to make their so-called youth points, but rather redesign the process themselves. The second of three points, quick points to highlight is one of building accountability uh, in line with what Madame Diop described and accountability specifically to parliament. So as direct representatives of the people, it's really essential for parliamentarians to have the information that they need to hold the government accountable. And so the annual report for Canada's national action plan is tabled to parliament. We have several parliamentarians who've taken additional steps like holding committee hearings or doing dedicated studies. And again, a challenge that we have in this front is generating reports in a timely manner and in a format that are both uh, timely as well as analytical. So we wanna make sure that we are not just collecting data, but we're putting it together to form information that can inform changes that we might wanna make. The third and final point is about making sure that women, peace and security is a broadly shared priority and seeing it as a lens for both domestic and foreign policy. So as we all know, for a long time, there have been effectively two types of national action plans. One that saw women, peace and security as important to foreign policy and defense, and another for whom it was an important issue at home. And I think we all have to have much greater focus on those two coming together. In Canada, we have our first national action plan, it had three partners, defense, foreign affairs, and our national police. Our second one now has nine, including two very important departments that focus on Indigenous Canadians, recognizing that First Nations and Métis and women in Canada pay a heavy price of living at the, the intersection of colonialism, racism, and sexism. And again, an area where we're trying to improve there is articulating how the principles and concepts of women, peace, and security are relevant to a largely domestic <laughs> that there's real buy-in across the government as well as up and down with it. So having numerous partners can make the situation more challenging. And I'm going to end here so that we can carry on. Es que la chica que lo va a recibir ya tiene que participar en un foro y no se puede, no se puede levantar. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Actually, I lost the last no. second because someone is not muted. Thank you. Thank you once again, Jacqueline. Si 
Me lo trae, no me lo trae. No, someone is not muted, dear colleagues. We all need to mute our microphones. Thank you, happens all the time. So thank you so much, Jacqueline. And you actually, I like particularly that you detangled the meaning of meaningful participation, early consultation and formalizing the processes. It's very practical tools to ensure meaningful participation. And you also gave me the segue to our next uh, panelist, with, which is in relation to uh, young people. Now, Daniela, over to you, my dear, because on the basis of your experience in Colombia, what were the very challenges, the specific challenges in implementing the women, peace and security and youth peace and security agendas on the ground? And what are the main barriers that women and girls in your country face in terms of participating and implementing peace process? Daniela, over to you. Gracias, Susan. Bueno, buenas tardes, compañeros. Un saludo de armonía. Eh, desde Colombia hemos enfrentado pues, diferentes desafíos. Yo creo que el primero de todos tiene que ver precisamente con el incumplimiento del acuerdo de paz, tanto por parte del gobierno nacional como también por parte de los grupos armados que se sometieron a, al acuerdo. Y todo este incumplimiento nos ha llevado a un contexto en este momento de un recrudecimiento de la violencia de un recrudecimiento del conflicto armado en los territorios, de un aumento eh, excesivo en el reclutamiento de niños, niñas, mujeres y jóvenes a los grupos armados ilegales, llámense disidencias o grupos delincuenciales, también a un fortalecimiento de todo este negocio y toda esta economía de la guerra con el tema del narcotráfico, en el cual nos vemos involucrados tanto niños, niñas como jóvenes y mujeres, tanto en la cadena de producción, de consumo, de comercialización y también eh, desde también la cadena de volver nuevamente el cuerpo de las mujeres como un objeto sexual en estas zonas en las que se da todo el tema también del cultivo, de los cultivos ilícitos y últimamente también eh, frente a unas amenazas muy grandes con el tema del reclutamiento de los jóvenes, no solamente hacer parte de grupos armados, sino hacer parte de toda esta cadena de producción. Eh, es el caso, por ejemplo, del de, de municipio de Caldono, que tiene más de 500 jóvenes en, en este momento, en el departamento del Cauca, en un municipio de Argelia, que están allá eh, precisamente en esta cadena de producción. Eh, son jóvenes que no tuvieron oportunidades para continuar sus estudios más allá del colegio y que tampoco tuvieron oportunidades de conseguir un trabajo digno en el territorio y debieron desplazarse a estos lugares a buscar una fuente de, de, de ingreso económico, pero que lastimosamente por no llevar a veces eh, un certificado de los territorios están siendo asesinados. Entonces es una situación en la que estamos viviendo que es muy alarmante y en el cual también vemos que pues, la afectación a las mujeres y las niñas es sobre todo muy particular y tiene que ver también con el tema del abuso y la violencia sexual que viven ellas en esos territorios y sobre todo pues también a las que hacen parte o han reclutado a los grupos armados. Es una situación pues que, que es muy compleja y que eh, digamos el llamado un poco que se hace también a los entes internacionales es hacer esa, esa presión y ese seguimiento al cumplimiento del acuerdo de paz para que también se, se logre de algún modo eh, poner en el centro de la discusión esta situación tan grave que estamos viviendo en nuestro país y sobre todo en el departamento del Cauca, en la zona norte y sur de nuestro departamento. Eh, creo que es muy importante alertar o, o buscar estrategias frente a este tema de la acción humanitaria con todos los niños y niñas que están en este momento pues, en toda esta cadena del narcotráfico y que lo único que, que pues, está llegando a nuestros territorios es eh, como pueblos indígenas, el territorio para nosotros es algo sagrado y toda la afectación que está teniendo el territorio pues también lo estamos viviendo nosotras en nuestros cuerpos, lo estamos viviendo nosotras con nuestros hijos, nuestros hermanos, nuestros padres y nosotras mismas pues en, en carne propia. Entonces el llamado es un poco a eso, pero creo que la experiencia de Colombia eh, nos lleva a hacer una alerta frente a esta situación tan compleja que estamos viviendo en este momento. Thank you, Daniela, for sharing with us so so openly the experiences sorry i'm going just to turn off my my uh, interpretation just so i can hear myself with no echo 
here we go. Uh, and you came back a number of time to also what our first panelist, uh, Ms. Radika alluded to, the economy, the economy, the economy. So there has to be an alternative for that war economy that portrays and take roots specifically in the chronic uh, sort of crises where it becomes an economy of its own. Uh, thank you so much. And we will actually turn now to the ICRC. And I would like to pose the question to uh, Ms. May Malone. ICRC is on the front lines of humanitarian response in conflicts such as Colombia, but other countries as well, of course. And often you are calling out parties that breach international humanitarian law and norms. What do you see as a key strength and weakness of the international humanitarian law in preventing and responding to violence experienced by women in conflict and post-conflict settings? Thank you very Over much. Over to you, May. Thank you, Suzanne. I'd like to echo the thanks and congratulations uh, to the organizers of the event today. And in particular, I'd like to say muchas gracias a Daniela por enfocarnos un poquito más sobre la situación local y todo lo que está pasando y, y, para, y, y por haber puesto eh, los asuntos locales en, en, en el medio de esa, esa conversación que, que estamos teniendo. Um, I will also just uh, cut down some of my speaking points for the sake of time, but you will see that some of them maybe refer to issues that uh, Maria and Angela um, and Ambassador Highland have also mentioned. But something that's really struck me about what Jacqueline has mentioned is the peer-to-peer -peer sharing and the dynamic of that and the real impact it has around the development of um, women, peace and security national action plans, particularly addressing the domestic facing aspects of it. So as many of you will know on the line here today and many of the attendees will know, the ICRC comes at the angle of security and peace building from its humanitarian work on the front lines of armed conflict. We continue to witness the gendered effects of war and of other humanitarian crises that have been deepened even more still by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has exacerbated pre-existing inequalities. As has already been mentioned, we too have also seen the alarming increase in incidents of and risks of sexual and gender-based violence in humanitarian settings everywhere. And women and girls have simultaneously experienced a reduction in their access to healthcare, also because of gender inequality and different gendered norms in society. Female medical practitioners on the front line in war zones have provided unrelenting care despite COVID-related stigma, and despite violence against healthcare and healthcare workers. And we've seen um, girls separated from families by war that have been stranded by lockdowns and a standstill sometimes in reunifications of families. So the combined impacts of conflict and COVID on women and girls, they remain deep, complex, and they will be long lasting. So in light of the conversation we're having today as an aid worker and as a humanitarian, I would be remiss if I didn't say that in light of such enormous needs and the risks to safeguarding the gains that have been made around gender equality and humanitarian action, that today states and humanitarian actors need to redouble their efforts to ensure the provision of assistance and support to women and girls currently and continuously affected by conflict and ensure the faithful application of humanitarian law and its um, complementary frameworks. So very quickly, the strength of international humanitarian law in addressing women and girls' needs lies in its power as a living body of of law applied every day, we see it in action. It is there to mitigate harm on battlefields and it is part of our daily conversation with weapons bearers. To give you some examples of what international humanitarian law means for women and girls, well, IHL requires that the specific protection, health and assistance needs of women and girls affected by armed conflict are respected. It prohibits adverse distinction in its application, meaning adverse based on race, sex, religion, political opinion, national or social origin or any other similar criteria. And this requires in effect that there be substantive rather than formal equality in application. It also prohibits sexual violence, uh, both in international and non-international armed conflict against women and girls, boys and men and anyone. As we look back into history from Beijing to 2021, we do, as has been pointed out um, here, and you know, 
throughout the forum and in the in the youth caucus and, and through the development of things like the, when, uh, the youth peace and security resolutions, we have plenty to celebrate. Strides have been made to incorporate gender perspectives throughout, for example, the ICRC's updated commentaries on the Geneva Conventions to update what were outdated sexist interpretations. International criminal tribunals have clarified gendered crimes. It's now clear that sexual violence can constitute a war crime, an act of genocide, and a crime against humanity. Article 7.4 of the Arms Trade Treaty explicitly recognizes the connection between arms transfers and the need for states' parties to conduct risk assessments on the incidence of gender-based violence through the use of these weapons. So moreover, parties to conflict have widely incorporated IHL's prohibitions on sexual violence. But IHL and Women, Peace and Security contain different norms. So what are the key opportunities right now? Well, firstly, while IHL contains uh, key obligations for parties to armed conflict, it's limited in scope. It applies only to armed conflict. And it doesn't prohibit or have anything to say, for example, on intimate partner violence. Here, women, peace and security and international human rights law have a crucial role to play as complementary. And so May, I'm ICRC, sorry, I just want to say that yeah. you have 30 seconds because we have two okay. more speakers and we have a couple of. Yeah, sure. So an important component um, of the implementation of any action plan would be to include the domesticization of international humanitarian law. And we have a checklist. You can check it out on my Twitter. I'll post it Great. for this. And the second Thank thing is just very briefly that IHL has something to say about the need to take account of the equal treatment of women combatants. This has implications for the planning of all militaries. Maria mentioned women combatants. What happens when women are taken as prisoners of war as combatants? Well, IHL has something to say about this and it needs to be complementary. So like Ambassador Highland said, and we're all saying we need to use all of these tools together to make equality and humanitarian action much more real. Thank you. Thank you so much, May. And I'm actually gonna use one of the questions that we do have in our chat to you, Sandy, because you're our next speaker. And it is the question that we had in mind for you because a number of our participants posed that very question. So now we're starting already with a question and answer session. Sandy, on the basis of your work in Palestinian territories, can you elaborate on the importance of engaging women and girls to promote peace and security for all? What are some engagement mechanisms that you use uh, on the ground? Over to you, Sandy, and you have three minutes. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, there are quite a number of mechanisms to ensure the meaningful participation of uh, young uh, women and women in Palestine. I'm not going to repeat because um, so much uh, discussion has been happening around the uh, gaps and successes in national action plans, but I would like to echo that uh, monitoring uh, at the resources needed for implementation is a gap. And I want to add to that the tokenistic representation of women and youth versus the actual leadership and engagement of those uh, two uh, specific populations. Now, I'd like to highlight that the legal and uh, political environments in Palestine are really fragile, and they are a threat to women, peace and security in general. Um, just to name some examples, domestic laws are outdated, discriminatory against girls and uh, women, and they are not harmonized with international instruments. The Legislative Council is not functioning for 15 years now. And uh, on top of that, um, uh, Palestinian women and girls are affected disproportionately by the occupation. Their human rights, their physical and uh, human security is at risk. They are impacted by uh, forcible displacement, by uh, denial of clean water under the blockade of Gaza, just to name a few. And uh, this is not exclusive for Palestine, Susan. This is happening in the region in general. Uh, displacement, refugees, uh, um, lack of access to justices. If you look at the global south in general, but more specifically uh, in the uh, um, MENA region, uh, you see that women's uh, uh, fundamental rights are at risk. And uh, what is enshrined uh, uh, under IHL and IHRL are really uh, being threatened. And uh, we have seen how uh, conflict 
conflict in uh, Sudan, Yemen, Libya, among other countries, uh, Syria in the uh, uh, region has been um, too obvious on the lives of women and girls, demonstrating how ultimately gender equality and human rights are integral to achieving sustainable peace. Now, what we can do and how we can use this uh, very vivid platform. Um, for a real acceleration of progress to achieving gender uh, equality and world peace, we must prioritize and really shift our understanding of ending wars, demilitarization, and holding perpetrators accountable to their crimes against humanity and ending the culture of immunity. Uh, we also need to look at controlling armed trades and is, as enshrined in the Arms Trade Treaty, as well as redirect funds from, from weapon to development. Uh, we also need to um, take concrete actions on what it takes to decolonize aid and development, to engage as multiple stakeholders as possible, to build partnerships, adopt new ways of thinking, and uh, radical approaches towards the redistribution of power, including dismantling patriarchal structures in peace building and humanitarian action. Um, given also the interconnectedness between durable global peace and the security of global south and the uh, MENA region, it's also imperative to genderize multilateralism, multilateralism and make multilateral spaces and processes access, accessible and inclusive and engage intersectional young leadership to amplify their vision and priorities. And lastly, it is absolutely time to put more monetary and other types of resources towards civil society and women rights groups and shift the power towards them while allowing mutual trust and local ownership as many of our esteemed panelists previously highlighted. And um, we also need to be unapologetically transparent about where com money comes from, where it goes, who has power uh, uh, over the distribution and who has access to it. And um, uh, uh, also, um, Ten seconds, increase Sandy. International aid, increased percentage of gender related funds of international aids to ensure and ensure it reaches um, women's rights and feminist organizations. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you so them. much, my dear. And thank you for so quickly taking a question also from the floor. And actually, now we have our last participant who I also will give because we've already started the Q&A session. We're also checking if we can run five minutes late, if possible. So this question is for Your Excellency, Madame Levenchuk, and the question to you, which also comes from the floor, is can you share an example of localization of the women, peace and security agenda at the national level? And what has been your experience from Ukraine? Over to you. Thank you very much uh, for this question. And uh, also thank you for finding frame and modality uh, and organizing virtually this important discussion within the Generation Equality Forum. In 2016, during the hot phase of uh, ongoing aggression of Russian Federation against Ukraine and occupation uh, by Russian Federation territory of Crimea and part of Donetsk and Lugansk uh, Oblast. Wait, Dr. Mutera, raise your work with that connected. Uh, demain, ils ont une génération d'équalité et on a le uh, humanitarian. I'm sorry, someone is not muted. I'm very sorry. We all need to mute. Thank you. Uh, on Security Council resolution and since then has taken action to improve women's participation in peace process, security and defense sector, and protecting women's rights related to conflict and post-conflict context. Localization and such engagement of bigger number of stakeholders, wider involvement of non-governmental organizations to regional consultations, public hearing, strategic sessions, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation efforts. As a result, it helps to identify clearly target audience and bring their perspective in women, peace and security agenda, as well as secure greater transparency and accountability. For example, non-governmental organization, Ukrainian Women Fund, which has been working for years in close cooperation with government commissioner for gender equality policy, developed the methodology of 1325 localization based on the global network of women peace builders guidelines 
which were adapted to Ukrainian context and introduced at local level. This organization also conducted mapping of available original instruments uh, on women, peace and security and capacity of stakeholders to implement them. It supported the creation of the coalition on the women, peace and security at gender and local level. The coalitions developed experience of coordinating activities on regional action plan implementation, helped to make sure that different stakeholders had mutual understanding of what should be done to promote women, peace and security agenda, developed and implemented communication strategies which gave opportunity to reach more than 2 million people. In October 2020, Ukrainian government adopted second national action plan 1325 until 2025. And uh, I have to mention that we look at the plan as a framework, framework that allows integrating gender equality principle into different programs and action, both at national and regional level. And at the end, I would like to stress that in the context of the pandemic and the economic crisis, it is critical that Ukraine does not put gender agenda out of focus. As long as women, peace and security agenda due to localization is brought closer to people, to local context and needs, women and men, uh, see the benefits of gender uh, equality policies for them and demand the authorities to keep pursuing gender priorities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Levichenko. And actually, both you and Sandy uh, were great in terms of also already starting the Q&A session. We can stay for four more minutes or even five more minutes. So we're actually going to take two more questions, if that is OK with our panelists. And I'm checking here in real time. What are the main, what are the red threats? Uh, so I'm going to put up one question and please let's try to keep the answers to, let's say, one minute maximum. Now, uh, in terms of, there's a number of questions in terms of human trafficking, women, peace and security and trafficking of, of uh, girls and women, I assume anyone who would like to take that issue and reflect on it for 30 seconds to 60 seconds if so raise your hand doesn't seem to be a popular question oh okay fatima over to you 30 seconds Um, this is actually an extremely important issue for us in West Africa because a lot of the trafficking um, to the West and now more to the Middle East is from West Africa. And our concern is that it is a criminal enterprise and it's not an organized kind of migration based on people's skills. So young women are being moved right now as we speak. We have a serious issue with young women being trafficked from Nigeria to Mali and from there to the Middle East. And we're working very hard to get them back to Nigeria. It's just because of the COVID that we had an excellent plan, but it didn't pan out because of uh, COVID. We couldn't make all the um, necessary arrangements to get them back. We know where they are located. It was just an issue of getting the Mali government. And we know also Mali had some issues later on. But we are still working on it. And it's becoming too widespread. And um, also, people are being trafficked for organs. And this is something that we need to talk about. And mostly, it's people from the so-called subaltern world being um, taken out to um, places who can afford to buy their kidneys. And um, of course, they're told that they have jobs like computer science jobs. They get there just to find out they're being harvested, that their organs are being harvested. And these are serious issues that we're dealing with. And we are not going to stop um, trying to 
have a solution. And most of the people trafficked, like I said, are young women. And this is Thank very you. serious. Thank you so much, Fatima. I'm actually gonna ask this question particularly to Ms. Kumaraswamy. You have been part of a number of similar processes betraying to peace negotiations. I would like to ask you a question. When you have a peace agreement signed, there is always a window of opportunity to implement that peace, to see the peace on the ground. That window is usually closing very fast. For that reason, most conflicts relapse. During that window, during that time frame, what is the most important issue to keep in mind to ensure that peace is translated from an agreement to the ground, i.e. peace dividends? What is the most important? I think um, research has shown that uh, accountability is often the issue that allows for uh, the peace to sustain itself. Because if you go through a truth commission, an accountability com commission, um, if you as a society begin to talk about these issues, you begin to heal but you very quickly go back to war if it's only a deal between two groups and you don't deal with the issues that led to the war. Um, so I think that is what uh, we have found over time is that issues of accountability, truth commissions, reparations, uh, those kinds of things where you actually deal with issues on the ground uh, and you deal with the past, you deal and heal together mm. and mm. what stops it from mm. going on. But also women's presence is very important, as you know, the research has shown that um, where women have been parts of the peace process and peace building efforts, things are much mm. more likely to. Mm. And I would also assume that in that healing process, women's participation and active contribution is of critical importance, right? Yes. Yes, and of course, the issue that many of you alluded to also throughout our panel, uh, the economy on the ground to try to get away and find an alternative to the war economy. So there's a number of red threads that we take from us today. The, the word accountability that you alluded to now, I think was repeated at least 11 or 12 times, only during these 60 minutes. Uh, and uh, I simply cannot thank you enough for being with, he with us here today, all of the 12 panelists, uh, and sticking also to the timelines. Our dear audience, we had more than 200 listeners today. Uh, and I think we actually got a number of questions also to our panels prior to opening up to the question and answers, because some of the questions in the chat, chat were within... Uh, Suzanne, you're uh, muted at the moment. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, just a huge thank you. And I really commend you all for being with us here today and sharing your extraordinary insight in this subject matter. Thank you so much. And I really hope that we will see each other soon again. Thank you and take care. Goodbye. <laughs>